Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is part two in a series entitled The North Woods of Lower Michigan. Part two. Let's get straight into that. In the days that followed the discovery of the first hiker, the thought of whatever had killed him weighed heavily on my mind. I am not a firm believer in anything supernatural or cryptozoological in nature, but those tracks had kept me awake at night. When I was finally able to sleep, I had terrible nightmares about that first victim. I was in the woods, shrouded in darkness, when the hiker sprinted past me, eyes wide with fear, looking over his shoulder at seemingly nothing. Then I saw a hulking shadow bounding after the man and gaining on him with an inhuman speed. At first, the shadow was a hundred yards away, but in an instant, the beast had closed the distance to 50 yards, leaping over unturned trees and agility that I had never witnessed in my life. It was on all fours when it was within 15 yards of my position, and the moonlight struck it just so that I could see the monstrous head of a dog and what could only be a man's rippling torso, covered in a thick black fur. And I swear, it was smiling. I woke in my small bedroom covered in sweat and was on the verge of hyperventilating when my cell phone went off. When I answered, the coroner was on the phone and he told me that he needed to see me right away as what he had found during the autopsy is unbelievable. I told him that I'd be there within the hour as I slowly got up from my bed, my shirt sticking to my chest in a cold sweat. I showered and got dressed for the day, still reeling from that nightmare. When I arrived at the coroner's office, I showed myself in and found the coroner examining the hiker with a curiosity that was very unlike the aging man I'd known for so many years. He ushered me over to the table and explained to me that the victim, despite his silver white hair, was only 23 years old and seemed to be in perfect health. He was only able to determine that through partial dental records and some tattoos that the young man's family had to identify. As I was soaking that information in, the coroner was going on about the trauma that the poor man had succumbed to, and I faded in and out of the conversation, only realising that he was still staring at me and not speaking anymore. I apologised and explained that I hadn't been sleeping well the last few nights. I asked if he could repeat the last few sentences. Of course, he obliged and said that in his professional opinion, the wounds he suffered didn't actually kill him but rather he appeared to have had a major heart attack. He said off the record, it looks as if it exploded in his chest. He had talked to the man's family and they said he was the definition of health and there was no history of heart disease within the family. He went on to explain that with the hair and the heart, it appears that he died of fright and the wounds were post-mortem. My phone rang when he was done speaking. I excused myself and took the call. It was Derek. He told me that two more bodies were found about 30 miles west of the first scene and he was headed over there. I told him to swing by the coroner's office and pick me up. While I waited for Derek to arrive, I thanked the coroner for his time and went to the parking lot to smoke a cigarette. I hadn't smoked a cigarette in over 10 years but I had stopped at the Wesco in Baldwin and got a pack because the cravings were back and I had the feeling that there would be many more sleepless nights in the future. The cigarette had calmed my nerves just enough to face the day ahead. When Derek pulled in, I snubbed the cigarette out on the bottom of my shoe and tossed it into the garbage. When I opened the door to Derek's truck, he gave me a motherly and a wag of a finger and said, I thought you quit 10 years ago. I told him I didn't want to talk about it and he relented for the time being. He handed me a coffee and a bag of donuts from Wesco. I had already had one coffee and a donut, but 
one can hardly say no to another donut from there. And as I ate the second donut and drank the rest of my coffee, Derek, Derek explained that the officers had found the bodies when they were driving down the M37 and saw a pair of towel lights with the interior lights on. When we arrived at the scene, it was just after 7am and the officers had turned the car's engine off but had left everything else as they found it to preserve what was left of the scene for us. My first instinct was to check the ground surrounding the car for prints and, as I expected, there were the same prints from the first scene. I called Lena when I found them and told her to come out to verify what I was finding. She told me that she would rush out right away. While we were waiting for her to arrive and investigate it further, while the smell wasn't as bad as before, we knew it would get worse as the sun came up further and baked the remains of the two victims. I told Derek to get his mask on as I placed mine over my nose and mouth after putting the Vicks under my nose. Somehow, this scene was worse than the first. Maybe because it was two people instead of just one. Or maybe it was because of the carnage that was laid out before me. The car was an older model Pontiac Grand Prix and the roof was caved in as if something extremely heavy had landed on top of it. Judging by the lack of skid marks leading to the site, Derek and I concluded that the car was parked at the time of impact with the roof. One door was completely torn off the hinges and the other was hanging on by a hinge, but just barely. We moved on to investigate the bodies when Lena pulled up in her dark green Silverado with the DNR emblem on the doors. I gave her a quick briefing on what we had found so far and let her go on with her side of the investigation. Once I got back to the bodies, I found that while they were mostly intact, the male of the two was split almost in half at the waist. He appeared to have been flung against the tree with enough force that it splintered the very wood of the tree. He was slumped over, neck hanging at such an angle, his hair was dragging across his spilled entrails, looking very much like a deer that had been hit by an 18-wheeler. The girl was in better shape, but not by much. It looked as though she was attempting to flee when whatever had killed her boyfriend had hunted her down and pounced on her back. With my gloves on, I turned her over to see more. Her face was contorted in a rictus of absolute terror. She was topless and I could see that whatever hit her from behind hit her with enough force to break all of her ribs as they were poking through the skin in various spots resembling a jagged mountain range. She had thick clumps of black fur under her nails and long, thick scratch marks across her arms, each scratch going deep enough to see bone. While I was investigating her remains, Lena called out to me. She confirmed my suspicions that they were the same prints. I asked if she could identify the fur samples from the girl's fingernails. She said she would try, but it was unlikely. As she suspected, she couldn't identify the fur, but said that maybe the tribe's elder could. So, we took some samples and bagged them for her to take. Once the samples were bagged, she was on her way, and we were wrapping up our investigation. I told the responding officers to contact the chief and suggest that we place a curfew for the area for the time being, until we get this ordeal situated. The chief wholeheartedly agreed and told us that he would take care of it. We wrapped up the investigation for the time being, around noon, and surprisingly, I was ravished. We decided to stop at Pompeii's for some lunch. As we were waiting for our pizza, the local news was on with the breaking story about the two teenagers we had found hours earlier. The next segment was the chief standing in front of the station declaring that, as of today, there will be a curfew in effect for all citizens in the immediate area. He went on to say that anyone caught out after the curfew would be fined and taken into police custody. He re reiterated that this curfew was for the safety of the public. After he said that, after he said that the gathered reporters exploded into a deluge of questions, all of which 
the chief declined to talk about. The rest of our day went off without a hitch as Derek and I tried to recreate the scene of the most recent case. We had determined that the couple had went off into the woods and parked their car to have sex. At some point, they were accosted by the hulking beast. Our speculation was that the hormonally charged male was full of bravado and attempted to defend himself and his girlfriend. He never stood a chance against the monstrosity as his girlfriend only made it about 20 feet from the scene. We decided to call it a day and head home after combing over the details we had speculated. As I was exhausted from a long day and lack of sleep, I decided that I was going to need a drink tonight to help me sleep. So, I stopped at the party store and got a fifth of Crown Royal Regal Apple and made my way home. When I pulled into my driveway, my phone rang and I was surprised to see Lena's name pop up on my screen. She began to tell me about the fur samples as I was getting the liquor from the back of my car. She was explaining that the tribe elder, Two Bears, had said it was most likely from a canine and he showed great concern upon hearing about the prints we found. She was beginning to say more when I walked up to my front door and dropped the phone and liquor. Around my door, jam and across my door, there were jagged claw marks and in the soil off my patio there were paw prints. Wow! As I said guys it's definitely getting more and more interesting a lot more scarier. Please do stay tuned for part three I will be uploading that very very soon. As ever guys please do like and share please do comment and remember folks be safe not sorry.